welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm putting this video together for those of you who are maybe taking your RV out for the first time and you're feeling a little intimidated by hooking it up at the campsite and getting everything connected and then maybe dumping the tanks and getting everything disconnected when you leave. So if you maybe did a walkthrough at one point but you didn't retain any of that information and you're feeling overwhelmed, then I'm going to simplify everything and I'm going to do two scenarios where you have full hookups at a campground where you have water, electricity, and sewer. Or we're going to do a scenario where you're boondocking, which is basically just camping anywhere without connections. No hookup, no water. You have to use everything that's on board in your motorhome. So I'm going to cover both of those things and I'm going to simplify it for you. So stay tuned. All right, step number one, we get your campsite is you want to make sure your RV is level. My RV doesn't have a built-in leveling system, so I use these leveling blocks. I'll put links to everything I show you below. But the very first thing when you get to this campsite is you want to make sure your RV is level. You don't want to sleep in an angle. Your fridge will work better if you're level. So figure out which way you're tilted, either with a bubble level or I just looked and saw which way the rain was running off my roof and that helped me get my RV level. You can look in your sink and if there's water pooling in one side of your sink, you can tell that part of your RV is lower than the other. So there's numerous ways to do it. Bubble level is the easiest. If you have a leveling system, even easier. But I use these blocks. That's the very first thing I do when I get here. Step number two, I'm gonna chalk my wheels, especially while I'm working around the RV. I don't want there any chance of it rolling away. And when I'm inside the RV, I definitely don't want it rolling anywhere. So even if you have a drivable with a parking brake, parking brakes can fail, especially if you have a tow behind, it's not gonna be attached to your car. You wanna make sure you chalk your wheels so you don't accidentally go rolling away. You made it to your campsite, you parked, you got level, you're not rolling away, it's time to hook everything up. So we have three things to hook up. We have electrical, we have our water, and we have our sewer. I personally like to go cleanest to dirtiest. So I start with electrical, then do the water, then do the sewer. So when you get to your campsite, your electrical hookup will look something like this. This is the standard outlet that you're used to seeing. This is the 15 amp think extension cord. This is for 30 amp RV hookups. This is for 50 amp RV hookups. So you can tell which one you have because the 30 amp is three pronged, the 50 amp is four pronged. So your cord will tell you which one you have. You just want to make sure that you shut off the breakers first. I always like to hook everything up while it isn't connected. The next thing I'm going to do is plug in my surge protector. You want one of these that just protects all the electronic equipment in your RV. If there's a power surge, it'll protect it and keep everything from blowing up in the RV. So I'm going to go ahead and plug that in next. I have 30 amp. Nothing happened. No lights came on because I had turned the fuses off. So now's my chance to turn them on. And these lights are telling me that it is okay to plug in my motorhome. If not, there'd be a red light flashing right here. This means it's good. It'll tell you exactly what's going on right there with your cheat sheet. So now I know it's safe to plug in my RV. Now I can go ahead and plug in the cord that came with my RV. Again, I can tell I have 30 amp because it's got the three prongs. So that goes directly into the surge protector. Now I just take the other end. I've located where the connection is on my RV. It's pretty easy to find. It's usually well labeled. And I just hook her up. And that's your power. One little side note and pro tip is it is going to be raining here all weekend. It's in the forecast. So this box will, prote will protect this connection here. But then this one's still hanging out in the breeze. So pro tip, plastic bag, perfect solution. Poke a hole in it and just feed it through. Now you've got this one protected under here and this connection where they connect is protected by the plastic bag. Keeps the rain out. So that's it for our power. Our next step is water. We're gonna locate our spigot. This campground makes it super easy. They put the spigot right on the side of the power podium here. So it's time to get my drinking water specific hose. So the three things you're gonna to need to have clean, safe drinking water is a drinking water specific hose that you only ever use for drinking water. You never use to flush anything gross. You're also gonna want one of these water filters because campgrounds have some questionable water. Um, other than that, you just need a water pressure regulator. The pipes in your RV are plastic, and if the pressure's too high coming out of this spigot, it can actually burst your pipes, which would suck. You get leaks, water damage. You wanna avoid that, it's real simple. You just get a water pressure regulator, 
problem solved. So the order I like to do this in, everybody does it different. I'll show you a couple of different ways, but I like to go water filter first. Just attach it directly to the spigot. Then I do the pressure regulator. Make sure it's nice and tight. Then I do the drinking water hose. That's my preferred order, but again, I'll show you another way in a minute. Let's attach it to the RV. Now it's time to locate your water connection. Mine's right here by the spare tire, and you're gonna have two options. There's this one, and there's this one. If you open this one, you'll be able to see the difference. This one's just a big empty hole. That's the one that goes to your onboard freshwater water tank. So that's something you'll use when you're boondocking mostly. If you just wanna hook up to the water at your campsite, you're gonna focus on this one right here. So if I put the hose into this one, this will create pressure from the spigot and put it through my pipes, bypassing my fresh water tank. So I'm gonna close that one for now. We'll talk about it later. Let's go ahead and hook this up. Once I've got everything nice and tight, it's time to turn on the water. Okay, everything's hooked up. The water's on. So I've got spigot to filter to water pressure regulator. And then I run my hose around the back of the podium just so it doesn't cross wires with my electrical. And it comes around the back and hooks right in to my water. This is one of the alternative ways to hook up your water. Um, it goes water pressure regulator, water filter, and then hose. So a lot of people prefer this method because if there's any dirt or mold in your hose, then the filter would filter that out before it got to your RV, and it's still regulating the pressure, so you're good there. I just don't like this because of my particular RV, this angle, I don't like the weight of all of this sitting on my fitting right here. So I do it the other way, but if you want to use your input as drinking water, this is a way to make sure nothing gets in there from your hose. And you can add a 90 degree elbow right here, but again with my angle that doesn't work for me. But if you have one that's flush with the side of your RV, you can use that 90 degree elbow and then that takes all the weight and pressure of the angle off there. It'll just hang down at a more natural angle. Now that I've got power and water, let's knock out the sewer. Located the sewer connection, I just need my stinky slinky. I've got my stinky slinky handy. It's time to find my connection. This one's usually well labeled as well. Mine's right in here. They're all gonna look like this. You've got the black tank and the gray tank. The black tank is your sewage. That's everything that goes in the toilet. The gray tank is everything that goes down your drains. So gray water is way less dirty than black water. Black water's toilet, gray water's everything else. Showers and sinks, etc. I have a hose with the other end that has a flange to help it fit in all these different size holes that you come across. So I'm just going to insert that and press on it a little, try to get a good seal. It doesn't really jiggle, so I'm just going to put a rock on it for good measure. It's just because you don't want that coming out and spilling everywhere. That's a real hot mess. So you just want to make sure that it's in there securely and water can run out from your tanks to the hole in the ground. They do make a device to kind of hold this up like a bridge. If you look at it from this angle, you can tell that it goes downhill and then uphill, which won't really work if I decide to dump my tanks. I would need to put something underneath it to make it slant downhill the whole way so everything doesn't get stuck in the low part of the pipe right here. But I don't have one of those with me and I'm just gonna use the dump site on the way out of here. So for the purpose of this video, this is just an example, but you definitely don't wanna leave it like this. While we're on the subject of sewage, when you're hooked up like this at a campground and you have the correct angle, you can leave your gray tank valve open. It's okay to let that water flow out and dump as you use it, but you definitely don't want to do that with your black tank valve. You want to leave that closed, and here's why. If you're using your toilet, you're going to have fluids and solids, and if you leave the black tank open, then the fluids are going to run out without breaking up the solids. So it's going to create what's called a poo pyramid where it just kind of piles up in your black tank and it becomes this solid mass that'll eventually clog everything. And it's horrid. You don't want to do that. So what you should do is leave it closed until it's mostly full. And then when you pull your black tank, those fluids will help flush out the solids and you avoid the poo pyramid. Oh, also real quick. 
Uh, when you know you're getting ready to leave, you want to close your gray water valve here and let that gray water tank fill up at least halfway. So that way when you do get ready to dump your tanks and leave, you can pull the black water first, let that all flush out, then follow it with the gray water. That'll clean the interior of your pipes in there and help clean out your stinky slinky a little bit so it won't be just black water and all that goo gets stuck in there. But we'll talk about that more at the end. We did it. We're all hooked up. Wasn't that bad, right? Pretty simple. So now that we're inside out of the cold, let's talk about some functionality in the RV systems. And let's talk about specifically being hooked up at a campground where you have full hookups, where you have the power, the water, the sewer, versus boondocking where you're camping somewhere where you have no connections at all. One of the easiest ways to figure out if you've hooked up your electrical correctly is that your microwave will be on. When you're driving and you don't have your generator on, then the microwave does not receive power, so you won't see those numbers. So if you see those numbers showing up, you know you've hooked up right. If you don't have a microwave, an alternative is to look at your three-way fridge. These modern RV fridges will automatically sense the cheapest power source and switch to that if you have it on auto. So when you're driving, it'll run on propane gas, and as soon as you hook up to electric, it'll switch over and you'll see the little AC light lighting up right there. That also tells you that you are getting electrical input correctly. Something that only has one power source is your stove. It's probably propane if you have an RV like mine and it will only ever run on propane. So if you plan to use your refrigerator without being hooked up or your stove at all, then you need to make sure you have plenty of propane. Your RV should have a uh, control center, something like this. This will tell you how full your tanks are, what your battery's doing, all the important information. Uh, you can see that my freshwater tank is empty because I only plan to use the hookups here at the campground. And like I mentioned, hooking up the hose the way I showed you will bypass the freshwater tank. So it's empty, but I still have water. And we'll talk about why in a second. Uh, obviously, my lights are going to run off electricity. So now that I'm hooked up to electricity, I have unlimited light power. I'm not going to drain my batteries by leaving my light on. Uh, my water heater is a gas water heater only. So even though I have electric hookup, it will only run on propane. So again, if I plan to use my water heater, I need to make sure I have plenty of propane. And right here you have your water pump. And your water pump is what creates water pressure when you're not hooked up the way that I just showed you. So when you're hooked up, the pressure comes from the spigot itself. You don't need anything to create that pressure. It's kind of like your house where you turn on the faucet and there's enough pressure the water just comes out. But when you're not hooked up to city water and you're trying to pull from your fresh water tank, you have to create that pressure. So if you're using your fresh water tank without water connections, you'll have to turn on your water pump. But if you're like me and you have an empty fresh water tank and I'm hooked up to the city connection, if I think I need my water pump for pressure and I use that despite being hooked up, that will actually damage the water pump. So if you don't have any water in your fresh water tank and you're running your pump, you can actually destroy your water pump. So you want to remember that your water pump is needed to create pressure when you are not hooked up to city water. If you're hooked up to city water, the water naturally comes from the spigot. And if you think about how fast that water comes out of the spigot, you can make it easy to remember that your pressure is already there. You don't need the water pump, especially if your tank is empty. You don't want to do damage to that water pump. So like I just showed you, my water tank is empty. My water pump is not on, but because I have a city water connection, I've got water and I've got water pressure. So I'm bypassing my fresh water tank because I'm hooked up to a city connection. I get my pressure from that. I get my water from that. I don't need my fresh tank or my water pump. Something else to note, because we are in the bathroom right now, it's a good idea to always leave some water sitting in the bottom of your toilet like this. It will tell you if your seal is good, for one, and it will also keep stench from coming out of your black tank into your living space. So leave a little water there as a buffer. Um, this is about to get real personal here too. I don't actually put toilet paper in my toilet. I, you can get something similar to the poo pyramid with toilet paper. You can get a toilet paper pyramid. Also, it can get stuck to your sensors and it can gunk up your sensors and make your sensors wildly inaccurate. So I don't actually put TP in my toilet. I don't usually put solids in my toilet either. So it's not really gross to put all my TP right there. I'm typically at a place that has facilities. And if it has facilities, I'm going to use them for the dirtiest business and then just use this for like a midnight restroom or, you know, the simple cleaner things. 
everyone's most important question how do you charge your devices so when you're hooked up to electrical like i just showed you you will have live outlets so all of these outlets will work when you're plugged in as soon as you unplug those outlets are going to not be live you won't be able to charge anything go ahead and plug something in it's not going to do squat so a lot of rvs have a charging station similar to this where you have a usb input or two and right here you've got a 12 volt input or two and those run off your house batteries. RVs have separate batteries from the engine battery called house batteries. And if you need to charge something, you can still use your 12 volt and your USB, even when you're not connected, but that's drawn from your battery. So you're gonna need to take a look at your battery levels and keep an eye on that. If you're drawn from that power, you definitely don't wanna drain your house batteries because that will mean nothing in your RV will work. Your fridge will go out, everything's gonna go kaput. I forgot to mention that your oven works the same way as your stove. It's always going to be propane. Um, yeah, but that pretty much covers everything and where it draws its source from while you're connected. So let's talk about if you're boondocking. So it's pretty simple when you're hooked up. You know you hooked up your electricity. You know you hooked up your water. So you know where those things are coming from. You don't really have to think about it. The only thing you have to consider is that you don't need your water pump because you got your pressure coming in from outside. So it starts to get a little more tricky once you're boondocking. So for this next scenario, let's talk about the RV like I didn't have any connections at all and I'm just out there, off the grid, all alone, loving life. So now that I'm adventuring off the grid and I don't have hookups, these outlets are gonna cease to work. So I'm not gonna be able to charge anything here. If I wanna charge my phone or smaller devices, again, there's a USB, or I can run 12 volt appliances off my house battery. So my house batteries are daisy chained together. There's two of them. I have a solar system to recharge them, but if you don't have solar, you recharge your house batteries while you drive. They're going to charge off your alternators, so if you're not staying somewhere for like a week or two at a time and you're driving a lot, then your house batteries will automatically recharge themselves. But I invested in solar because I like to be off the grid a lot and I like to stay there longer and not have to worry about my power usage so much. Then without electrical hookups, the next thing that's going to go is my microwave. My microwave will not be usable unless I'm running a generator. But plot twist, my RV doesn't have a generator. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Stay tuned and I'll show you how I fix that solution. But no power, no generator, no microwave. But what about my food, you say? All right, so your fridge, again, is a three-way fridge. And as long as you have propane, it will run off your propane. And these fridges are pretty efficient. When you're running on propane, you can run for a long time off propane. It's not going to guzzle propane. But what will guzzle propane is if you're off the grid and you want to use your heat. If you want to do temperature control, it's going to guzzle your propane to heat this. It's going to drain your propane the fastest. So if you're off the grid and you want to stay there for a while, you should dress warm. You should have a lot of warm blankets because... Using a lot of heat is going to drain your propane, and then that'll mean your fridge doesn't work. That'll mean your stove won't work. That'll mean your oven won't work. And that'll mean your water heater won't work. These are all pretty big problems. So if you're going to be off the grid and you want to be warm, you definitely want to use something other than your propane for warmth. Um, back to temperature control for a second. Again, without having a generator, I can't run my roof AC. So... That's a whole nother problem. There really isn't a solution for that. I have to go places I know are gonna be cooler, so I go a higher elevation when it's real hot. I leave my windows open at night to cool the place down, and I try to drive and use my cab AC during the day. Since we've been talking about propane, this is what your propane tank looks like. There is a gauge in the back there that will tell you how much propane you have left, so you always know where you are. But you don't need to worry about filling the propane. That is a job you leave to the professionals. So you can go to a U-Haul station or a gas station and they will know how to fill it for you. Now we're off the grid, what are we gonna do about water? So the fresh tank that I showed you outside, all you gotta do is stick a hose in that, fill that sucker up and you have onboard fresh water. But to create that pressure, again, you have to hit that water pump. So to draw from your fresh tank, you just gotta turn your water pump on. Your fresh water tank will feed into your gray water tank just like normal. Nothing there really changes other than where you get your water and how you get your pressure. Now that we're off the grid, the gas water heater doesn't change. That's still gonna run off propane. That is always the same, but what you do want to consider is that if you want to take long hot showers, 
Uh, you are going to use up some propane, but more importantly, you're going to use up your gray water space. Your gray tank is usually a little smaller than your fresh water tank because a lot of your water is going down the toilet too. So it is possible to overflow your gray water tank and you might see water coming up through your shower drain because that's where it will go when it starts overflowing. And if you're not paying attention, you could flood your bathroom. And I can hear you guys saying, wait, back up. You don't have a generator. How the heck do you survive off the grid? Well, I have what we all call a solar generator. I have the go for it version. It's quite large. It'll say on the side here. It is the 1100 size. So this basically works like a electrical generator and inverter. So I don't have to use my house batteries if I don't want to. I can just turn this sucker on. I've got all my USB ports. I've got my regular house connections that I'm used to seeing and I can run 12 volts. So what this means is if I wanna plug my microwave into this, I can use my microwave off the grid without a generator. If I wanna make some toast, I can plug in a toaster off the grid without a generator. If I wanna charge a bunch of things at once, if I need a backup light source, this thing has got a big old light on the back. So these things are pretty awesome if you want to spend time off the grid. Um, you can charge it multiple ways. I can charge this from my solar panels. I can plug directly into that 12, por 12 volt port I showed you in the back, charge it from my solar panels or my house batteries, or just like my house batteries, I can plug it in while I'm driving and the alternator will charge it. So multiple ways to charge. This thing is really easy to keep topped off. And then I can run all my electrical stuff, blenders, uh, air fryers, uh, microwave the only thing it won't run is my roof ac it's not powered high powered enough for that but i did have a scenario where one of my house batteries went bad while i was out on a trip and i just plugged my rv into this thing instead of um the campground hookup that i showed you outside because there wasn't one available and this kept my fridge running and kept everything working until i was able to get my house battery fixed so if you're going off the grid this is a really good backup they can be kind of spendy um, I wouldn't recommend this brand specifically for everybody. I think if I had to do it again, I'd buy a different one and I'll put that link below because I got a good deal off of a uh, crowdfunding opportunity. So now they're a little pricey, but they are totally worth it if it's in your budget. A uh, couple of other things that are important to talk about while my heater runs in the background are adapters. Uh, an additional way to charge your house battery is with the regular connection, the one that you're used to seeing, all you need is an adapter. So since I have a 30 amp, this is a 30 amp to 15 amp adapter. So I could put this in here and I could plug my 30 amp right in here if I was staying at a friend's house or 30 amp wasn't available. I also carry a 50 amp adapter. So if I ever go to a campsite that doesn't have 30 amp, for whatever reason, they just have 50 amp or say that's the only site left, I'm not limited by only having a 30 amp, I can convert it to 50. But something to note about the 15 amp converter is that that power cord is not high enough to run everything all together. Like you wouldn't want to run a hair dryer in your AC unit for an example. You want to just be aware of your power usage because it is only a 15 amp cord and you can blow a fuse. All right, so that sad time has come when the party's over and it's time to dump your tanks and leave. I disconnect everything in the reverse order. I start with the sewage, get all that dumped and taken care of, leave the water connected so I can wash my hands after I'm done with this, and then disconnect the electrical. Um, some things you'll need, I like to have one of these clear elbows so I can see when the gunk in my black tank is thoroughly flushed and running clear. So if I have this clear portion, I can see what's happening. And you also wanna have a separate hose from your drinking hose that you can use to flush your tanks. Um, my RV comes with a flush connection here, so I can flush it from the top, which is really nice because then it kind of gets everything from the top down. But if you don't have one, this elbow, you can actually hook your hose up here and flush from this connection. You just open this little stopper. So as I mentioned before, you want to start with your black tank. So you go ahead and pull that. I'm not going to do it because I'm not actually dumping right now, but you, you'll hear it go through. You'll hear when it's kind of finishing up. Then you can go ahead and pull the gray tank to kind of flush everything out, clean it out. You'll be able to see it. If you have the elbow, you'll know when it's done. Um, and then I close everything back up. I connect my non-drinking water hose to my flush valve. 
I fill the black tank all the way up. It helps if you have somebody in inside checking your um, fill level, they can tell you when it's full. And then I'll flush it until it runs clear. If it takes a few times, then it takes a few times. If it takes four times, it takes four times, but you don't want to leave anything sitting in there. And you definitely don't want to let it dry in there. So um, when I'm done flushing my tanks, I disconnect my hose, I put the cap back on, then I go inside since I'm still connected to the water and I run my toilet and get about a gallon of water into my black tank and drop in another sanitizing pod for the next trip. I don't like to leave it dry. You can leave your gray tank dry. That's not usually an issue, but I don't like to leave my black tank dry unless I am going to winterize it and store it for the winter. After that, you just disconnect your electrical, wrap it up, put your cord away, disconnect your hose, put everything away. I like to do one last loop around the RV just to make sure I didn't forget anything, any caps or hoses. I didn't leave my awning out. I didn't leave anything underneath the wheels that I might hit, like a piece of firewood or something. Pull the RV forward, collect my leveling blocks, and I'm on my way. All right, so that's it. That's how your RV works. Uh, hopefully I made that simple enough for you to understand that you feel a little less intimidated to get that out there on your own. Um, if there were some questions you have that I didn't answer, go ahead and drop them in the comments and I'll get back to you. But to steal from one of my other favorite YouTubers, if you enjoyed this video, check out my others as well.